making sure that uh, different plugins work, different solutions can work on top of OpenStack. So uh, this session is, is about Hadoop and OpenStack. Uh, so at Rackspace, um, we are a pretty active user of Hadoop. Uh, we've been using it as far as I can remember since like 2008. So email and apps was a pretty big user of Hadoop since the beginning. A lot of internal teams within Rackspace, um, especially in the cloud, use uh, Hadoop in order to mostly do log processing and other kind of uh, analytics on big data. Uh, for, from customer's point of view, um, customers who want to do Hadoop on Rackspace, uh, they can either use our dedicated servers, we provide support on top of the servers, and you can uh, work with a partner like Hortonworks uh, in order to get support for Hadoop. Uh, on the public cloud side, we don't have a Hadoop as a service offering uh, yet on the pu public cloud, but you can do it yourself. And you can expect something in, in that space from Rackspace soon. Uh, on the private cloud, we do OpenStack private cloud. So you we can do OpenStack private cloud at your data centers uh, or ours, and among different applications that you can do on the OpenStack cloud, uh, Hadoop is one. So it's especially good ca use case when uh, you have data being generated within your data center where you're, uh, and if you have OpenStack running within that data center, then you can use, you don't need to go outside of your data center in order to do processing on the data. So other than that, uh, Hadoop on cloud within a private cloud is a good use case for development and testing uh, of Hadoop too. If you are not familiar with Hadoop, uh, I'll quickly go through the architecture of Hadoop. Uh, Hadoop mainly consists of two parts. One is the master node, and there are a bunch of worker nodes. The worker nodes have, are called data mm -hmm. nodes, and they have data node service and task tracker, tracker running on them. The master node is a name node and a job tracker. So you have a name node managing a bunch of data nodes, and Hadoop does replication of data in order to provide reliability. So, and that is the SDFS, Hadoop distributed, distributed file system side of it. And Hadoop provide computation on the data by providing a framework called MapReduce, where you can write MapReduce applications to do parallel processing of data. Uh, so if you want to do Hadoop on cloud, you probably want to go through the installation first. In order to do installation on the, uh, of Hadoop, since it's a distributed file system, there are many components on it, different servers. So you probably want to use a provisioning software. Uh, if, you, if you quickly do a Google search, probably you will come up with Apache Weir. It's an Apache project uh, started with Amazon, uh, deploying Hadoop on Amazon EC2. And it has support for, since it uses JCloud's API, it supports a lot of different clouds. So it has support for OpenStack. Um, it is easy to use, it uses common API for different clouds, but um, it's pretty limited in functionality. So. Uh, with uh, Weir, what you can do is, uh, if, if you're using Weir, you define an instance template where you, uh, where you mention the number of name node and uh, data nodes and where you want those to be installed. And you can use that configuration file and do like launch cluster and then do launch the cluster for you. But once you launch the cluster, you really cannot do much with it. Like you cannot modify it or you cannot, it doesn't provide monitoring and things like that. So it's good for development and testing. In the next step you probably want to do is you'll, you'll probably do write, write some Ceph recipes and do Hadoop deployment yourself. But if you, Hadoop, uh, Ceph is really good at that and you can use the same configuration tool in order to do other deployments of, the, of other applications in the cloud and you can use the same for Hadoop, it's good. But when you are talking about managing a cluster, Ceph can be pretty difficult to use in that case. But still, like you can make it work. Uh, and uh, with Ceph, you would, and the Knife plugin, you could probably do something like Knife OpenStack Server Create with this image and flavor, and then you can give it a role of a master node or a <coughs> data node. So as you need more data nodes, you keep doing the Knife uh, Server Create with for the data nodes. So it's pretty good, and most people who do uh, Hadoop on cloud use uh, Ceph, and they can use the same uh, recipes for dedicated to, it doesn't have to be cloud, except the Knife part problem. Another thing that keeps coming up is uh, Iron Fan by Infochips. It's also open source software, and it, 
it is very good on the EC2 side, but uh, for OpenStack, they don't have support for it. Although they do have a press release and a blog post saying that they support OpenStack, but there is nothing in the code. So I talked to that guy and they said like, yeah, we did talk about it, but we never did it, so. But with Amazon, if you're using Amazon, it's pretty good. And somebody can probably go and add a provider for Rackspace or OpenStack Cloud too, but it's not there yet, so somebody needs to work. And it builds on top of Ceph and Knife, so. Another thing is uh, Apache Ambari. It's also an Apache project. It is mostly UI driven, so it is, uh, it is like point and click. And it also has API support, but almost everybody uses the UI side of it. Although you can use the API. It provides, other than the HDFS and MapReduce, it also provides other add-on services like Hive, Key, and Edge Catalog, and things like that. And it also provides monitoring through Nagios and Ganglia. And with with Ambari, you have an Ambari server, and then you install agents on a bunch of nodes where you want to install Hadoop cluster. So you kind of have already a list of nodes where you want to do Hadoop on. So there is really no way to provision Hadoop, right? So if you look at all the deployment options, there is really a need for a Hadoop project that works with OpenStack seamlessly with VMs and then just not, not just the deployment, but managing and uh, monitoring the service. So when I uh, submitted this talk a couple of months ago, I didn't know there was any interest on Hadoop on OpenStack or not, because in the previous conferences, I didn't see anything like that. Uh, but since I submitted this talk, I've seen a lot of interest, and there has been a project announced in the OpenStack community for doing Hadoop as a service on OpenStack, and a lot of companies are working on it. So at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Imam Su in order to go through the rest of the talk on uh, what he is doing with Hadoop and OpenStack. Imamsu is from Hardenworks, and if you don't know Hardenworks, it's one of the leading contributors to Apache Hadoop, and they have recently joined OpenStack Foundation too, so they really bridge the gap between OpenStack and Hadoop and, and really work in that area, so. Cool, so thank you, Sudarshan. So uh, my name is Imanshu Bari. I'm a product manager at Hardenworks. One of the things I'm responsible for is taking our Hardenworks data platform and enabling it across the different cloud, cloud environments. So a quick snapshot of what is Hortonworks for some, you know, this is an OpenStack conference, so folks who don't know about Hortonworks. So we are the only 100% open source distribution of Apache Hadoop. And the way we go about doing this is, uh, you know, we are spin-off from Yahoo, so we, we employ the key original architects, developers, and operators of, of Hadoop within Yahoo. Uh, we work with these, guy, the, these guys uh, and, uh, uh, you know, drive a lot of innovation within the open source, Apache open source community, and also enable a lot of uh, partner ecosystem. And some of that is validated by our key strategic partners you see listed here. Then uh, it's not just about, about Apache Hadoop. Uh, a true enterprise uh, distribution for Hadoop uh, involves a lot of supporting projects around Hadoop. So we take all of these together, uh, we run it through our test suite, and we distribute a completely 100% open source uh, uh, enterprise Hadoop distribution. And the last step is from all the experience that we've gained by supporting Hadoop platform at scale across various enterprises, we provide enterprise class support to all of our customers. So that's, that's a quick overview of who's at Hortonworks and that takes us to the next question of, you know, why, why, why Hadoop and why OpenStack? So, you know, Hadoop and, uh, Hadoop and OpenStack are probably one of the biggest sort of trends in IT today, right? So it sort of makes sense. You know, two celebrities, let's get them married. Uh, the, way, the way I see it is, uh, you know, we don't want the marriage to be like a typical celebrity mar marriage. We want it to last, right? So that raises a question, wh what does each person bring to the table, right? So let's, let's spend a couple of minutes talking about that. So what, is, what, what does OpenStack really mean to Hadoop? Now, as we work with our customers, what we find is uh, as the big little elephant settles down within a typical enterprise, there's a lot of challenges, so, so specifically operational challenges around, around Hadoop in the enterprise. So if you look at that elephant here, in, in the middle, you got the different departments. There's finance, there's marketing, there's compliance. Every, everybody wants their own little version of Hadoop, and they have different requirements in terms of capacity, privacy of data, and other issues. Not only that, you combine that with the different sources of data. Like, you know, you got data from, web, uh, from the web, you got data from mobile, and uh, you know, that just means that not only you have different versions of clusters for different departments, there might be different sets of clusters to support the different characteristics of the data. 
To add to that, there's different types of use cases. There is batch use cases and there is interactive use cases. So we often find customers wanting to have different sets of clusters to support different types of use cases. And that's not enough. You know, as an enterprise goes through their typical uh, Hadoop adoption journey, they find that they have to run clusters for QA, for production, for testing, for performance, for, for, for performance validation. And that just means that, hey, there's all these different types of clusters that, that a typical operations department has to, so has to support through the whole life cycle of the, of the project within the enterprise. And then, you know, what, to, to sort of solve that problem, what we, so we started seeing customers do is that, hey, they'll go to Amazon, they'll spin up a cluster, do some basic testing there. And the next question it raises is that, okay, we want to bring this stuff in-house now. How do we do that? Uh, the, the fundamental gap is on Amazon, it's not the environment that the customers control. Right? So just because something works on AWS doesn't, really, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work in your own private cloud deployment. So this is what OpenStack really build, uh, brings to the table for, for Hadoop. It, it gives, it, it gives uh, a way to alleviate all the different operational complexities of running a Hadoop cluster within the enterprise. And we'll talk about some of those use cases in detail next. So the other side of the coin is that uh, what does Hadoop bring to the table for OpenStack? Right? And in my mind, it's really three things. Uh, uh, you know, for uh, first is uh, it's new. Hadoop is new to the to, to IT. It's new to the enterprise, so it doesn't have all the bells and whistles. Whistles, the legacy processes attached to it. So it gives that perfect use case for a typical enterprise to do their POC on OpenStack. The second thing is it scales horizontally. So uh, you know, for for a typical cloud application, the general expectation is that the high availability and scalability should be sort of built into the application itself. And it should not rely so much on the infrastructure to provide those capabilities. And this ties well to the architecture of Hadoop because it scales horizontally. And the third part is it's really a big giant shared platform in the enterprise. And we just talked or spoke about that, how different groups need to use the Hadoop platform for different use cases. So all, all these three things put together means it's like it's a perfect greenfield use case for OpenStack in the enterprise. All right, so with that, I want to I want to I want to say that you know, Hortonworks completely supports the project Savannah that was recently announced by our friends at Mirantis. So Savannah really uh, promises to be this glue that ties Hadoop and OpenStack together. Now, just like marriage, I was saying you know there needs to be certain rules of you know how do you how do you work with each other to make sure that there's no, there's, there's no conflict, right? So there's a little charter I have, uh, uh, I have on the right here that sort of calls out what are the responsibilities of Savannah? What is it that Savannah will bring to the table for this integration between Hadoop and OpenStack? So starting with you know, tra tracking of Hadoop clusters, so mapping of different the clusters to the tenants, uh, it will provide an API. Uh, so and the API part is really key here. So what it is saying is you know, we don't want Savannah, we don't want OpenStack to be too much into the details of how to configure and manage a, a, a Hadoop cluster. And, and at the same time, we don't want a Hadoop cluster to be too much aware of the fact that it's actually running within OpenStack. So that differentiation of responsibility is what Savannah brings to the table. It, provide, it, it, it works with both the parties through APIs. So uh, that brings to the next step is, okay, so you know, that, that, that it's a great idea, let's, let's integrate Hadoop and OpenStack. What are some of the uh, key benefits that you would see? So what I've done here is I've uh, bucketed the benefits in three, in, in three separate ways, starting with self-provisioning, and couple, there's a couple of use cases under each, each bucket, right? So if you talk about self-provisioning, uh, like we discussed, all these different groups within the enterprise wanting, wanting a Hadoop cluster, uh, typically we do, you don't want the operators of the, of the clusters to be the bottleneck. If you enable self-provisioning, you can have the different departments and the users within the enterprise provision their own clusters. And, uh, and the second aspect is, uh, you know, the Hadoop, Hadoop cluster is not a single, it's not easy to deploy. You know, there's a lot of moving pieces. So uh, to, you have to find a way to reduce the op operator error in this process. So what this integration between Hadoop and OpenStack promises to do is it provides to sort of, uh, pro it promises to provide uh, pre-built templates so you can just say go provision a QA cluster. The second part is uh, elasticity. So you can, you can have a, a pool of resources, a pool of physical resources, and you can scale up and down by adding new nodes and removing nodes from your Hadoop cluster as needed. 
uh, you can you, you can solve problems like cluster time sharing. Now we hear from some customers that you know they they have some workloads running on OpenStack, but at night there's not much activity happening. So can they use those that set of resources to run maybe some Hadoop bad jobs? So it's not really possible if you're doing this in a in a physical environment. So that's uh, that, that's one use case that we see as being a key a sort of a key benefit of doing this integration. And the third part is the multi-tenant Hadoop. Now, you know, there's, there's two aspects here. Is the first is uh, uh, by, by having a Hadoop cluster run on top of OpenStack, you can support uh, multiple types of SLAs, right? So based upon the groups and use cases, there are different resource requirements for the Hadoop cluster. By, by function of having it run on top of OpenStack, you can tune those resource allocations based on clusters and provide specific SLAs to different, user, different groups. And the last part, the, the, the second point there is uh, simplification of maintenance. So now again, you know, if you read, look deeper into how a typical IT department is going to support Hadoop and go through the life cycle of going through various versions of Hadoop, you know, you, you've got multiple clusters running. Uh, they might be at, on different versions, right? So how do you handle use cases around uh, maintenance or doing uh, rolling upgrades? So by having a Hadoop cluster run on top of your OpenStack environment, it really gives you that simple platform to alleviate a lot of these maintenance and upgrade related issues. So we'll, we'll dig deeper into all of these different buckets and I'll lay down some of uh, you know, what, what our thinking as Hortonworks is in terms of how we want to approach the different use cases along these three buckets. So first is uh, self-provisioning. Now I have two phases here. Uh, so the phase one being uh, template-based provisioning and the phase two being Hadoop as a service, which is job flow based provisioning. So let's start with the phase one, which is a, the template based provisioning approach. So, so one option here is like I was saying is that you want to provide a click to provision you uh, experience to your users. So what we will do is, you know, we will enable so something called, called as a cluster template. So typically we see an enterprise uh, go through a process where they'll tweak and tune their cluster for different use cases. And then they are like, hey, you know what? This is great. Now, can we provision a yet another cluster to adhere to this exact same configuration? So what this will do is this will provide them an ability to sort of take that configuration, save it as a template, and the next time they want to provision, they can just do a single click and provision an entire Hadoop cluster based on that template. Uh, that raises the question that, hey, you don't always need single click to, uh, single click to provision. You want some sort of flexibility. And that's the second part here, right? So, uh, we want to support not only cluster level templates, but go one level deeper and support node level templates. And the node level templates can be of two, two, two flavors, right? One is a typical sort of an Amazon type flavor where you have a, a node dot large, node dot small and whatnot. And the second type is more Hadoop specific because uh, Hadoop, the typical Hadoop cluster has different, different nodes. Each node has different functions. So you can create a template based on the function of the node within the Hadoop cluster. You can modify those templates and then either save that template or provision a cluster based on the modified template. So, you know, again, to summarize, single click provisioning, simplicity, as well as the flexibility to modify the templates and provision based on that. Phase two is now where we move into more of a Amazon EMR type experience. And what this says is that you, the first step is you allow the user to upload the data, upload the data to an HDFS based cluster or a simple Swift based cluster, right? And then based on that data, you define different job flows. So the job flows would be support, will be a parallel to the type of job flows you see on Amazon EMR today. And then get results either on Swift or HDFS based on you know, what the user's preference is. So let's walk through some of the detailed steps of how this process will work when it comes to provisioning. So what I have here is uh, the, the basic assumption is a VM image is just OS. There's nothing else on the, uh, on the VM, it's just a vanilla OS image, and that's stored in Glance. So what happens is the user comes into Horizon, and it doesn't necessarily need to be a Horizon UI, Horizon UI plugin. It can be just a direct interaction between the user and the Savannah controller APIs, right? But the point is the user comes in and specifies the cluster blueprint. Uh, it's a new term I'm introducing here. Blueprint is basically all the different uh, configuration parameters of the cluster. Uh, number of nodes you want, how many resources you want to allocate to the different nodes, the different Hadoop services you want to be running on the different cluster nodes, etc. All that information is captured into a blueprint and submitted to the Savannah controller. The Savannah control, the controller then looks at this and says, okay, I need these 10 VMs to, to, to fulfill this request. So then it goes to NOAA and get, fetches all those VM images from Glance and fires up all those VMs. 
So notice at this point, what you have is a whole just a bunch of VMs running. There's no, there's no Hadoop cluster yet, right? And this, this now takes us into the point where we are saying that we don't want OpenStack to be responsible of uh, being able to tell, you know, what are the different Hadoop specific configurations that has to be done to start up the Hadoop cluster. So that's where uh, uh, so the Savannah controller installs the Ambari server. Now Apache Ambari is a centralized management platform for Hadoop. So, you know, the, the goal here is for Savannah to install the management, plat or management platform for Hadoop and then delegate the res responsibility of configuring the cluster itself to Apache Ambari. And that's what it does. So it will, it will then basically pass on the entire cluster blueprint to Apache Ambari and then Ambari will take care of, you know, configuring all the different nodes uh, uh, in the Hadoop way and starting up the entire cluster. So this is one option, right? Uh, the second option is uh, some customers might, might say that you know they, they are okay with incurring the overhead of managing different VM snapshots that are more purpose built, right? And that's what I have here is that the VM image in this particular case is actually pre-configured to be a certain Hadoop node. So what, what this assumes is that the customer installed the Hadoop cluster uh, and did a snapshot of all the different VM images and stored that VM image in, in glance and the provisioning is based upon those existing VM images now. And in this particular case, again, the workflow is, is by, by and large the same, but the key difference is when, when Nova actually provisions the VMs and the VMs start off, they are, they are actually Hadoop nodes. It's not a functioning Hadoop cluster yet because the wires have not been tied together, but it's still uh, actually Hadoop node VMs that are, that, are, that are spun up. And at that point, again, the Savannah controller then sort of uh, tells Ambar, the Ambari management server as to which are the different slave nodes that you need to manage to make this into a Hadoop cluster and it informs the different slave nodes uh, as to which are the master nodes that you, that you should be talking to, right? And once that wiring is done, you have the complete Hadoop cluster running. So these were the two sort of, uh, you know, workflows that we were envisioning for, from the provisioning standpoint. To give some sort of a color on, uh, you know, how the user experience would be, uh, you know, we just have a simple mock-up here. Uh, again, you know, what, what it is trying to say is that there's two options. One is if the customer picks a custom option for the template, that means that they want to specify all the configuration parameters, and then they go about specifying the capacity instances, the data persistence options, and the different Hadoop, the Hadoop services themselves. And if not, they can just, at this point, they can just pick a pre-built template and provision based on that. So once the cluster is provisioned, uh, how do you actually go about managing and operating the cluster? So here, what we are thinking is, uh, since Ambari management server is provisioned as part of the cluster, uh, there is an option to actually, uh, when, 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 when an OpenStack tenant comes in and logs into your, uh, the Horizon dashboard, based on the VMs that they have access to and the Hadoop clusters that are being running on top of those VMs, they will see a link to manage each and, each and every one of those Hadoop clusters. And that will be a link to the Ambari management server. When they, when they click on that link, one option is to just basically, uh, there will be a single sign-on between that tenant, the OpenStack tenant, and the Ambari management server itself. And uh, the Ambari management console will load up within the same frame in, as, as, as your OpenStack dashboard here. So again, that sort of goes into you know, giving, giving that integrated experience uh, so that for, for the OpenStack tenant, for them, they don't have to worry about, you know, signing on to different, different, different consoles, keeping track of the links to manage the different Hadoop clusters. And again, it, it sort of uh, ties back to the point that we don't want to reinvent the wheel on the OpenStack side, and we don't want to build in the, the, all the logic of managing a Hadoop cluster on the, open, on the OpenStack side, right? So all that stuff will be delegated to the Hadoop management platforms like Apache Ambari. Okay, so let's talk about elasticity next. And uh, what I've done here is, you know, I've tried to sort of break down the question of elasticity on two dimensions. On the x-axis, we have the cluster life itself. There's short-lived cluster and there's long-lived clusters. And on the y-axis, we have the node elasticity, right? Uh, and, and, and how we configure the node elasticity. So the one option is manual, where uh, the assumption is that the, the user comes in and they manually add and remove nodes. Uh, when I say manual, it, it just still assumes that there is an API, there is an API and a UI for doing that, but it's just that it's not happening automatically. And the second option is rule-based. Now, in terms of what specific parameters you would be able to pick on the rule, that is still something that we are evaluating. But uh, to give you some examples, you can, you, 
you know, uh, uh, you, you, when, you, when you configure a job flow, you can say that, hey, the, the fifth step in my Hadoop job flow, I expect it to need a lot of compute capacity. So I'm going to define a rule in my job flow that says that when it reaches step number five, fire up all these five new task tracker nodes so I can have additional compute capacity within the, within the cluster. Uh, that's one way. The second way is uh, make the rules more, uh, uh, you know, uh, more rule specific to the cluster resource utilization itself. So based upon the CPU and memory utilization of a node within the Hadoop cluster, you can say that if my CPU utilization is constantly trending upwards beyond a certain threshold, not just spikes, but a constant trend, then hey, I, that means that I need to add some more uh, compute capacity to the, to, the, to the Hadoop cluster itself, and I can specify a rule for that. So, you know, when, we, when, when are we planning to sort of deliver on these, uh, on these different uh, dimensions? So first is, uh, uh, for the phase one, we are targeting manual node elasticity. And uh, in terms of where we see these being useful, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the long-lived clusters are useful for sort of predictable workloads. So if you have, let's say, a QA environment that you have to have up and running for testing all the different Hadoop scripts, but you know, as your cluster scales and as the amount of testing you're doing is, is going up, you need to eventually add more capacity to that cluster, right? So, uh, so the long-lived clusters with manual node elasticity, elasticity is great for that. The short-lived cluster is, uh, uh, with manual elasticity is great for the typical dev and uh, QA workloads which are very short-lived. So you know, let's say I am an analyst or a developer within the enterprise. I wrote a couple of uh, scripts, uh, Hadoop scripts, and I want to just see if th those work. You know, before I move those scripts to uh, the, the production environment, I can just go to my OpenStack-based uh, Hadoop cluster provisioning system, provision a cluster, and do my testing that way. So the second aspect of the rule-based uh, elasticity, uh, so for, with rule-based elasticity, elasticity and a long-lived cluster, that's the first quadrant there, it, it's really important to support, uh, it's useful to support highly variable workloads. And these are basically uh, the type of clusters that you would provision based on job flows. So, you know, if you have a job flow, uh, you, 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 you started the job flow, the cluster ran, and, uh, you know, you have some rules in the job flow itself to scale up and down the cluster capacity. So you can specify, you, you, you can that, use this for that. And that's phase two. So, Next, the other point around uh, elasticity support is often the question is, okay, where is the data, right? And as I said, that there's two options. Uh, one option is to have the data on HDFS itself, and the second option is to uh, have the data on your Swift object store, right? So what, what we have here is uh, how, how it will work for, when the, for the use case where the data is actually residing in Swift. And for what I'm saying here is that for phase one, uh, we, will, we will basically deliver a HDFS and Swift bridge that will, uh, and, and the kind of user experience it will provide is your existing Hadoop jobs, the, the, the MapReduce, Pig, and Hive jobs, they don't necessarily need to change. They will keep on interacting uh, just like uh, they do for a typical, for a, for, as if the data were on HDFS, right? So they, they still look at the data in a hierarchical fashion. Uh, they still do the operations like create, read, write, just like it were, it, were a, it, uh, it were a typical HDFS file system. But what the bridge does is that it transparently maps all those operations to the Swift world. And it also maps the hierarchical structure on the HDFS side to sort of the flat structure that is available on the Swift object store side. So in this example you see uh, is the, you know, we have a directory and the file one uh, in, on, on a hierarchy, and it is mapping to so sort of dir slash file one uh, on the Swift side. And that is because uh, the Swift file names support back uh, forward slashes. So you can basically achieve the abstraction of having a, a hierarchical structure by putting slashes in the file names. The, the, the integration will support uh, multiple con containers as well as multiple Swift stores. So, and uh, the, there will be single sign-on through Keystone. So all this con configuration would have to be done on, on the Hadoop node through which you want to access the Swift object store? So there's a question in the back. Yeah. Uh, yes. We are a user and we'd be very interested in this, but we don't use Keystone. So do you plan to provide this also without Keystone? So the question is, uh, you know, 
they don't use Keystone, can you do this integration if you don't have Keystone? So I'm not 100% sure if it will work without Keystone, but I believe the answer is yes. I mean, if you don't want to have, if you don't want to have security set up, then you should be able to do, you know, basically bypass Keystone. Okay, so phase two is, uh, you know, focus more on bug fixes and optimizations for this integration. All right, so the last bucket around multi-tenancy. So the way I've broken down multi-tenancy here is around three dimensions. There is access isolation, there is resource isolation, and there is version isolation. So on the resource isolation side, you know, you sort of get it for free by, by function of running uh, your Hadoop cluster within a VM boundary. But there's one point there, the second bullet under resource isolation that says ability to pin a Hadoop VM to a particular physical node. Now that, that kind of becomes important as you start supporting multiple different tenants of, of, on, the, on top of OpenStack for your Hadoop clusters. And if you want to provide certain SLAs to certain, certain tenants uh, for their Hadoop clusters. Uh, if I'm right, right, today there is no way to directly instruct the Nova scheduler and tell, them, tell, it, tell the Nova scheduler to fire up a VM on a particular physical node. Right? So there needs to be an enhancement uh, to the Nova scheduler to sort of uh, have this functionality where you can instruct it to pin a VM to a certain physical node for this. So that will be part of the phase one. Uh, on the access isolation side, uh, like I mentioned, there will be single sign-on between between the Horizon dashboard itself of the user, the, your tenant coming to Horizon and then having to access the Ambari management console for, for the Hadoop cluster. Uh, but the thing to note is that there will be a, a single instance of Ambari management server per cluster. So if your tenant has like five different clusters, they will have five different links to five different Ambari management servers within, within the OpenStack deployment. And that's something that we will fix in phase two where uh, there will be a single instance of the Apache Ambari management server per tenant. So regardless of how many, regardless of how many clusters the tenant has access to, uh, the management of those clusters will be through a single instance of Apache, uh, Apache Ambari. So you don't have to spin up a new Apache Ambari management server for every single cluster request the tenant makes. So this is it. Uh, I guess at this point, next steps, you know, if you have more, more questions about this, please come find me. I'll be at the boot uh, or, my, you know, come, you can email me. Uh, you can download the Hortonworks Sandbox. Now, I want to say a quick line about Sandbox. The Sandbox is sort of a pre-built environment, uh, which is pre, it's a sort of a pre-configured cluster, and there's, there's test data sets, which you can use to basically kick the tires on Hadoop, right, and get a feel for Hadoop based on that. Uh, the link to download Hadoop, uh, our Hortonworks distribution platform and follow us on Twitter. So that's all. I hope this was helpful.